Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Got half a minute to go. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Witten Baptist on this lovely, sunny Sunday morning. As we come to prepare our hearts to worship our God and to praise his name and to seek his will for our lives. You will have received your notice sheet as you came in. Um, so I mustn't forget to welcome people live online. Good morning to you as well. Sorry, I do tend to forget, but you're part of us anyway. But uh, it's nice to say an extra hello. And to those of you who will be watching on Catch Up, you will have received your notice sheet as you came in. Uh, just a few things to highlight. Uh, we will be uh, having communion after this morning's service. And if you love the Lord as your saviour, please stay and join with us. For that on Tuesday at 11:30, it is the Thanksgiving service for our dear member and wife of Alan, Barbara Haskins. Um, please come and join the family um, to celebrate her life and to remember this lovely lady who was part of our lives here at Whitton for many, many years. And there is a buffet afterwards. Good Friday, we meet at 10:30 again for a communion service, where our pastor will consider the great battle, and then. The best Sunday of the year, every Sunday is good, but love Easter Sunday as we celebrate our Lord's resurrection next Sunday. He is not here, so where is the title of that service? Just to remind you that on Wednesday, our pastor is here at the church. Um, he's with the community cafe and available between 10 and 4. So if you want to talk to him, um, please give him a call or drop him an email or text and arrange. You can spend some time with him if you need to do so. This is the first note, week's Sunday's notice of a church members meeting to be held on Tuesday the 19th, that's Tuesday week. The um, envelope, the, the door is now closed for deacon's election and those standing are, and there's a list of people who have been nominated and a little bit about them each on the board at the back. So those who are standing for deacon for your prayers are Trev Maynard, Lorna Curtis, Astrid Tricker, Steph Bullock, Judith Lowe, re-election and standing for re-election and myself. So please pray for those candidates that God's will will be done. You'd be amazed to see we've collected £1,760 to go to Ukraine. That's just from Witten, um, along with um, Matthew's Church there in uh, Beresford Road in Lowestoft, who've also collected. White House are now doing their own thing. Matt's actually off to Poland today. I uh, should be driving to the airport now, and he's hoping to try and go down and see one of the churches. It's not too far from where Annette's family lives. So if he can, he will, and get some photographs and some feedback to bring to us. As I say, let's hope he can do that. There's a box at the back of the church uh, by the Bibles on the gas cupboard there. Um, if you've got any used stamps, they can be given to the local St Elizabeth's Hospice to raise very much needed funds. Right, I think that's it for now. So welcome to our service and I'll hand over to our pastor, Pastor Cole Maynard. These are virtually impossible to put on when you're wearing a mask. Get tangled up in all sorts of things. We got tangled up in traffic on the way to church this morning. Terrible traffic. I was thinking, isn't it wonderful that I'm stuck outside Ipswich trying to get into town because everyone wants to go to church. <laughs> and then you suddenly discover I'm going into Asda and into town and thinking, no. They worship at a different temple to me, sadly. But entrance is what today is all about. Coming in to a location, coming in to a place. Very recently we had the, um, the Oscars and, of course, made infamous by the actions of Will Smith. Um, but, you know, you watch these programs and they're all about entrance, making a statement. One of the actors actually had refused to wear a tuxedo. He was a, he was a guy and he wore a kind of tuxedo top and a, and a ball gown bottom just because he could. Looked quite bizarre, but there we go. We live in a very bizarre world. But he certainly made an entrance. And the prophet Zechariah writes in Zechariah 9 verse 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, 
a colt, the foal of a donkey. So let's stand and worship God by singing our first hymn, Creation Sings the Father's Song. come before you and we do indeed declare hallelujah praise your name praise you Yahweh and Lord as the earth wakens this springtime as we see the colors return into the plants and the buzz of the insects beginning to from their way about pollinating and bringing growth and life to this planet as our eyes witness 
cold nights and warm days, as we see buds on trees that have been barren these many months, as we see the browns beginning to have that hint of yellow, that hint of green, as we begin, Father, to see the, the main of the beauty of, of these trees beginning to just start to gain their blossom, we say hallelujah. And Father, as we wake in the morning and we put the kettle on and sit and enjoy a cup of tea or coffee as we fuel ourselves with breakfast and toast, as we begin to go out and encounter other people and recognize that we are a social being because you made us that way, saying hello to people in the street, greeting people as we come to church on Sunday mornings, as we begin to stretch this body into life, we recognize that we are fearfully and wonderfully made that our body is incredible. And even far as we get older and things begin to break and not work quite as well as they once did, we know, Father, that's only a temporary season. That one day, Father, each one of us will be renewed and given an even better body than this. We say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you that we have an eternal future and that, Lord, we can look forward and not simply look down. But even, Father, when life throws us a curveball, even when life is difficult, even when we feel perhaps that we're walking in unpleasant or uncharted places, we know that you are our God, you are going before us. And we know, Father, our eternal destiny. We know, Father God, that one day, one day, all this will end, all the uncertainty, all the pain, all the suffering, and there we will stand in your stand in, 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 in your kingdom and see you face to face and we will say hallelujah praise the Lord Father we thank you for your son Jesus we thank you Father God for your salvation we thank you for our certain hope for the faith you have given us and Father we just pray as we come into this place on Sunday morning we may walk with you this morning and grow with you and you may grow us and strengthen us and teach us, speak to our hearts and our minds, both thus gathered physically and those who are watching online. Lord, be with us. Help us to grow closer to you, that this Palm Sunday may be a time in which we once again welcome you into our lives, saying hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. I can only see one child, so I think it would be unfair to do a children's talk that involves a lot of activity. Um, so I think we'll probably go straight into our worship and sing our next song, which is The Splendor of the King. Thank you, worship group.
take your seats. We come to our reading now, which is based on Mark's Gospel, chapter 11 and verse 1 to 19. And I'm going to do something unusual now. When it comes actually to the cries of the crowd, um, when I come to verse uh, uh, 9 and I say, a uh, follow shouted, Hosanna, I'd like different people from the congregation to read, to make the next cries. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is one. Then verse 10, blessed is the coming of our father David is the next. And finally, the third one is Hosanna in the highest heaven. So I'm going to make you work uh, today, okay? So when those, th- those, those cries come out, if someone could just read it out loud, it would be lovely to have those cries coming from within the congregation rather than just from the front here at the lectern. So Mark 11, verses 1 to 19. Here, Mark records for us. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. 
If anyone asks you why are you doing this, say, the Lord needs it, and they will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied to a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written... My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. Can we have my slides up, please? So we're beginning a new series, um, just going over the Easter period called Mark My Words, which is basically looking at the Gospel of Mark and the account of Mark gives us of the Passion story. And so today we're looking at Palm Sunday, then on Friday obviously we're looking at Mark's account of the narrative, the story of the Passion, and then on Sunday looking at Um, Mark's account of the resurrection. So here we are, looking at Mark's gospel. Well, an alien once came to our earth and stepping down from his spaceship, shouted to the people who were gathered around, I come in peace. And then he pulled out a laser pistol and began shooting anyone close to him. One of the people who was watching people being cut down by his laser pistol shouted out, hang on a second, you said you come in peace. The alien says, you misunderstand me, I do come in peace. Peace is the name of my ship. (laughs) When we come to Palm Sunday, it's very easy to be confused. It's very easy to come at it with our own um, sense of history. We've had this story so many times. Pictures in our mind, even from Sunday school days, perhaps you were made in Sunday school to make uh, palm leaves out of crepe paper and cardboard and wave them around. In um, other church, some churches have been in every Palm Sunday, they get palm leaves that come over from the Middle East and in the shape of a cross and they're handed out. It's very easy to get back into the routine of simply this is Palm Sunday, the day we celebrate and remember Jesus entering Jerusalem. But it's very important to get the message, especially what Mark is trying to teach us about that Palm Sunday, because it was a very important event because it teaches a lot about Christ's coming. You see, it's very easy to get confused and think that here Jesus is coming into the, the, coming into Jerusalem, perhaps the first time as an adult. We know that he came into Jerusalem years beforehand as a child on one of the festivals, and perhaps this is the first time he's returning as a pilgrim, coming on that long journey from Jericho all the way up to Jerusalem. But that's not the case. Jesus had come to Jerusalem many, many times. 
His famous friends, Mary and Martha and, of course, Lazarus, lived in Bethany. And Bethany was a mile away from Jerusalem. It was considered to be one of the dormitory towns, the villages, where it's permitted for pilgrims to stay. You couldn't walk more than a mile on a holy day. That was the Jewish law. And therefore, to be considered to be a dormitory town, um, a festival dormitory town, you had to be within a mile, rate, a mile distance of the city. And Bethany was one of those. And he came to stay with Bethany, Martha, and, uh, sorry, um, Martha um, Lazarus, and Mary many times. He came into Jerusalem many, many times. In fact, Matthew records to us um, this particular event. And each of the gospel writers recall different things. And Matthew records that as he comes into Jerusalem on this occasion, he stops above the Kidron Valley. And he says these words in Matthew 23 and verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you will kill the prophets and stone those who sent you. How often I'd long to gather you, to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you are not willing. How often, Jesus said, how often he'd stood on that point looking over the city of Jerusalem. How often he's, he'd wept for this city. He'd wept for Zion. He'd wept for Jerusalem and its people because of their hardness of hearts. Jesus was not coming into Jerusalem uh, um, uh, 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 for the first time since he'd been a child. He'd come into the city many, many times. But when he comes in on this occasion, he is making a very definite statement. He is not coming as a pilgrim. He is coming as a king. And the first thing we need to see in this passage is this, that he comes in peace. He comes in peace. Now pilgrims normally travel by foot. So that's the way pilgrims travel. In fact, there's pilgrim trails all around the UK and they're normally marked with a shell, which is a sign of a pilgrim. And you'll see a, a, a pilgrim's travels have these, these little shell marks and people use them as a means of, of, of fitness as well as spiritual and physical fitness. They walk the pilgrim's way around this country. And pilgrims normally travel by foot. And together this party had climbed um, the Galilean hills to reach Bethphage and um, Bethany. Now, it's, it's very easy for us to think about that and think, you know, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem and, you know, in a journey. Jericho was, is one of the lowest towns in the world. And to get from Jericho to Jerusalem is over 2,500 feet worth of climbing. It is a 17-mile journey. Imagine you have to do that every Sunday to come to church. 17 miles, climbing 2,500 feet. Snowdon is 3,400 feet. So it's almost as tall as the highest mountain in Wales. It was a slog done on your feet. And that's when the pilgrims came up um, on that way. And we're told that 1.5 miles from the capital, we're told that Jesus got two of his disciples and told them to go ahead to the village and find there a colt that was tied to a doorpost. And that's exactly what the disciples did and what they found. You see, Jesus had made preparations. He wanted to come in, not as a pilgrim. He wanted to make a statement, make a very definite statement, which is quite bizarre because Jesus was a wanted man. All the entrances in Jerusalem were being watched by the Jewish religious leaders and their cronies. They wanted to get Jesus. They wanted to arrest Jesus. They wanted to silence Jesus. He was a threat. We're told this in this very passage. But they were scared of him. That hymn we sung earlier on, The Splendor of the King. Remember singing that? And that talks about darkness trembling at the name of Jesus. You know, the reason they silenced Jesus was not because they were more powerful than him, but because they were terrified of what he stood for. Don't get the impression that Satan has more power than our Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't. Satan trembles at his voice. Evil runs from the sound of the Lord Jesus Christ, from light itself. Whenever you shine a torch into darkness, what happens is the darkness goes. And Jesus wanted to make an entrance. He didn't want to hide. He didn't want to come in incognito. He didn't want to hide in the crowd wearing a hood. He wanted to declare that he had come because he was fulfilling a prophecy, a prophecy from Zechariah. 
the prophecy that says this, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He was given a very clear message to the people of Jerusalem and all the other pilgrims. He was giving them a signal and they got it. They got it because they give him a royal salute. We're told in verse 8 this. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. You see, this was a way in which you welcomed a king. If you look back in the Old Testament and look at 2 Kings chapter 9, we find there that Jehu, the king, is made, as Jehu is, is made king. A prophet comes to talk to Jehu and he goes away with, with him. He's, he's with a party of soldiers. Jehu goes away to talk to the soldiers. And when he comes back, we're told this in verse, verse 12 of chapter 9. They asked him what the prophet has said. And we're told, Jehu said this. Here is what the prophet told me. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. And then the soldiers quickly took their cloaks and spread them under, on the ground on the bare steps under him. Then they blew their trumpets and shouted, Jehu is king. This was a recognized way of welcoming a king, to isolate them from the mess and the coldness. What happened with Sir Walter Raleigh when he met Queen Victoria? Remember that story? And there she was in her dainty feet, in, in a nice silk pair of, of slippers as, as royalty would wear, and she came to a puddle. And what does Walter Raleigh do? He takes off his ornate cloak and lays it over the muddy puddle so the queen doesn't get her, to her foot feet wet in the mud. They laid their, their um, uh, palm leaves before him to, to honor Jesus. They were giving him a royal salute. That's the very reason he was on a donkey, a donkey that specifically had to be unridden. Because the donkey had never been used. It had a sacred purpose. It had never been used for anyone else. It had never been yoked. No one else had ridden upon it. Jesus was the first person to ride upon that donkey because that donkey had a sacred task. So why was Jesus coming in Jerusalem in this way? Why was he on a donkey? Jesus was sending very, very strong signals. Signals that perhaps aren't very common to us because people don't normally come into Ipswich riding on a donkey or even on a horse. They come riding in their cars and what have you, and their lorries and their vans. But in the ancient world, this gave a very, very clear picture. You see, when a king came into your city or a king came into your town, the important question to ask, does he come in peace or does he come to conquer? Does he come in peace or does he come in to conquer? And the king would let you know by the mode of transport he came in. In the ancient world, if a king came in peace, he would come into a city riding on a donkey. But if he was coming um, in, in to conquer, he would come on a, a white war horse, a white stallion at the head of an army, and that told you you either lay your weapons down or you will be conquered you'll be extinguished. Why a donkey? Well, donkeys are comical characters, aren't they? No one's serious about doing a riding or trying to leap, you know, at, at, at a, uh, to, 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 and no one's really wanting to appear serious is ever going to get on that kind of animal. Because donkeys are renowned for being comical. I've lived in the Middle East many times and the thing about donkeys is you see in someone riding a donkey it just looks comical around Iraq you know you see uh, people riding donkeys and their feet will be dragging on the on the ground because you they're so small you can't get your feet over them you know that's why in Shrek donkey is a comical figure Eddie Murphy plays you know comedian plays his voice he is comical something that looks it's laughable almost you can't look regal or majestic on the back of a donkey. In fact, donkeys were the workhorse of the ancient world. Royalty didn't ride donkeys. Dignitaries didn't ride donkeys. Donkeys were the workhorse of the common person. They were the white van of the ancient world. Because donkeys have very short legs, they have big laps, they're obdurant and difficult. 
People often find donkeys will stop and they won't move, you know, but they, but they are good workhorses. And so um, pack animals, they were a pack animal. They weren't an animal to be ridden by itself. They were, uh, they were the workhorse of the ancient world. So Jesus was saying, look, I come in peace. I'm coming in humility. I'm coming making a show, but I don't come to conquer. I come in peace. I come to bring you her, her salvation. And that's why the people shout out, Hosanna. Hosanna is a lovely expression. It quite literally means Lord save. And, and in, in, first of all, in the Old Testament, when it's received, it's a prayer. It's say, God save me. God save me. That later on becomes a, a prayer, and not only a prayer, but a declaration of praise. Like, God has saved me. It's a wonderful expression. Lord, save me. We find this in the Old Testament. Um, the woman of Tekoa, for example, goes to the king in 2 Samuel 14, verse 14. And we're told this, when the woman of Tekoa went to the, went to the king, she fell on her face to the ground to pay him her honor. And she said, help me, your majesty. That's 2 Samuel 14, verse 4. Help me, your majesty. Quite literally in the Hebrew, that is, Hosanna, your majesty. Hosanna, your majesty. Later on, in the, there's a desperate woman found in the besieged city of Samaria who sees the king walking on the city walls and she shouts to him, Hosanna, Hosanna, 2 Kings 6, verse 26. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, Help me, my lord, the king. Hosanna, my lord, the king. It was a prayer. Save me, save me. Jesus comes in peace. Jesus comes into Jerusalem to save. But he doesn't just come to save. He also comes inspecting. He comes inspecting. And this is one of these areas that we miss on Palm Sunday. Most people will get as far as he comes to save in peace, and that's it. Index, and we move on to actually Good Friday. But this is a critical reason that Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. He's coming in peace, but he's also coming to inspect. You know, it's very important when you read the Bible to look out for those little hints. There's often little clues that there's something deeper going on. You find it throughout Matthew's Gospel, in all the signs, uh, sorry, in John's Gospel, in all the signs, the seven signs that John gives, he always has little hints, little clues to something deeper in all, all the miracles of Jesus. And Mark's doing this here. Verse 11 is really key to this passage. In verse 11, we're told this Jesus entered Jerusalem. And went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now most of the other pilgrims that come into Jerusalem have gone to their bed. They've gone to their boarding houses. They've had a big celebration coming into Jerusalem and they went home. But Jesus doesn't do that. He comes into Jerusalem and he goes straight to the temple even though it's late. We're told it's late. And he looks around at everything. But since it was already late, he only then returns the mile journey back out the city to Bethany to stay with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Jesus is inspecting. He's doing something there. He's inspecting the temple. Because Jesus intends to do something. And then we go from that, this, this wonderful verse in 111 to have this really in, almost random story about all victory. Jesus gets the fire up the following morning. He's walking back for that mile journey back into Jerusalem. And he discovers a fruit tree, a fig tree. Now, what's special about a fig tree? Well, this is springtime. And figs were, one, were, were a common source of sustenance for the common man and the common woman. Because they, they were a wonderful uh, form of fruit that actually, uh, that actually um, fr uh, fruited. Oh, that's a wrong, probably wrong, wrong word. What's the word for it? it? It produced a fruit twice a year, not just once, in the spring and in the autumn time. And if you've ever had figs, um, they're a wonderful source of nourishment. They're very sweet. They give you lots of energy. And it was a, a wonderful bit, a bit of free food that was growing there and quite filling free food. I don't know if you, when I was a kid growing up in London, we used to have figs every year, figs and dates at Christmas time. Remember that? You, you get boxes of figs and dates um, that used to be sent, sent and we used to have them. Um, I said, prefer figs to dates. I never quite got on with dates. I think it's a stone thing. But um, figs and dates. So it was a great source of nourishment. And um, it, 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 at the first part of spring, 
when, when a fig tree is, is producing fruit, it becomes very leafy. So early on, if you've got a fig tree that's got lots of leaf on it, it will suggest it's producing an early fruit. It only normally gets leafy when it's got fruit. You don't get fig trees with fruit and no leaf. They produce leaf first of all, and that's normally a forebearer of the fact that it's producing um, fruit. So Jesus sees this fig tree. It's in full bloom. He goes to it. He searches through the leaves, and there's no fruit, no figs. He's hungry, and so he curses it. And he says to the tree, may you never eat fruit, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples hear it. Now in the Old Testament, fig trees are examples of the fruitfulness of Israel. We find some of the pro prophets using this as an illustration. For example, in Micah 7 verse uh, 1 to 6. Micah says, what misery is mine? I look like one who gathers summer fruit at the gleaning of the vineyard. There is no cluster of grapes to eat. None of the early figs that I crave. The faithful have been swept from the land. No one upright remains. The, the fig tree was used as an example of fruitfulness among the people of Israel. Hosea 9, the prophet says, Ephraim is blighted, their root is withered, they yield no fruit. And so we find that Jesus has come inspecting He's come expecting, he comes to this tree and he finds it is fruitless. And so he cursed the tree. And then he comes to the temple and what does he find there? What you have here in this passage, whatever's written in scripture is there for a reason. When you come to this passage, that whole account of the fig tree is key to understanding the cleansing of the temple. Because what's happening is Jesus finds a fig tree that has no fruit and therefore he curses it. And then he goes to a temple that has no fruit. And so finally in this whole passage, we find this. Sorry, that's the fig tree. I got ahead of myself. He comes in judgment. He comes in judgment. You see, Jesus comes into the city of Jerusalem in peace. But he also comes in judgment. Not of the people, but of their religious leaders. Of the state of the religion. Of the spiritual state of the nation. And this was prophesied in the Old Testament. Malachi 3, 1 to 5. This is why Jesus will get so, much, so often frustrated because I had such a wrong view of the Messiah. The, the view, the biblical view of the Messiah that Jesus had is there in the Old Testament if people only read it and understood it. And there in that passage, Malachi 3, we read this. God said, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you desire, will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure that day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Gold and silver are refined by fire. Then the Lord will have these... Have, then the Lord will have men who are, will bring offerings in righteousness and the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in the days gone by, as in former years. This is all prophesied. Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey in Zechariah and Jesus coming to cleanse the temple in Malachi chapter 3. You see, this wasn't Jesus' first visit to Jerusalem and it wasn't his first visit to the temple. And it wasn't his first cleansing of the temple. We need to understand that Jesus cleanses the temple twice. When you read John's Gospel, you find after the first miracle, the miracle of turning water into the wine, the miracle everyone remembers, after that miracle, he goes into Jerusalem and he cleanses the temple for the first time. You can read about that in John chapter 2, verses 13 to 7. Very early on in his ministry, having just performed his first miracle, he cleanses the temple at Passover in Jerusalem. And here he shouts at the merchants in John chapter 2 and verse 17. He shouts, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. 
It could not have been clearer. Three years beforehand, he goes into the temple and says, you have turned this temple from a place of prayer into a marketplace. Get these out of here. And then three years later, he comes back to check on all the progress of the Jewish religion. Now, people, when we understand this, we don't quite understand the, the outrage that Jesus felt. Jesus was a man of the people. He hated exploitation. He hated, peop he hated people who took advantage of the poor. And what was happening on the, on the temple forecourts was nothing more than a cartel of exploitation. And it all began when this particular man became the high priest, a guy called Caiaphas. And we know this from research. Around about 30 AD, when Caiaphas came to power, he saw an opportunity. You see, we were told that uh, Jerusalem sat right next to the Mount of Olives. And on the Mount of Olives, there were four markets, four common markets, at which people could buy birds and animals for eating or for, animal, or for, or for sacrifice at the temple. There were four of these markets. And what would happen is, before Caiaphas came along, people would go to these markets... And they, will, they could buy a, a, um, a, a, a dove or a, a lamb, if they could afford a lamb, at a reasonable price and then take it to the temple to be sacrificed. But Caiaphas was a very shrewd man. He was what we call nowadays an entrepreneur, but not a good entrepreneur. Okay, he saw an opportunity and realized. You see, there was a whole series of things that, people, that a Jewish person had to do at the Passover every year. First, they had to pay their annual temple tax. And that was around about six pence. Doesn't sound very much, does it, really? Six pence. But when you dis discover that 3.5 pence was a daily wage, that was two days' wage. That was quite a lot of money. They had to pay six pence. But the thing about your normal money, your normal shekels, is that you couldn't use them at the temple. Remember when you go into a place and someone says, your money is no good here? I used to know sometimes coming down from Scotland with, with Scottish money, they wouldn't accept it in, 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 in places, you know, you, what's this? It's, it's legal tender. No, it's not. It's got the wrong face on it. And they'd get really confused and they wouldn't accept the money. I'd get quite cross about it. But they'd get, in the temple courts, you couldn't bring normal shackles. You had to have temple shackles. And to, to, to get your money changed from normal shackles to temple shackles, it cost you uh, quite a lot of money. Normally, you pay another one pence. But that one pence, which is half a day's wages, that one other one pence was only one pence if you had the correct amount of money. If you needed change, then it cost you two pence. So it's now gone from six shekels, six pence, to eight pence in order to go and pay your temple tax. That was one thing. But when it came to offering um, animals, what Caiaphas had done was he'd actually made it virtually impossible to bring any other animals that weren't bought in, in, bought, bought in, the, in the temple precinct into the temple. He basically had all the temple inspectors throw it out, most of the animals, saying that's not perfect, you cannot offer that here. Now where you could buy a pigeon for six pence, which is three days wages, in the temple to buy a pigeon that was pre-approved by the priests... It will cost you 76 pence. Three weeks' wages. Now you get in a picture how Jesus is so angry, what is happening here. The religion of the Jews is meant to bring light to the nations, is being used to corrupt and feed the, the pockets of the merchants and the corrupt priests. The very religion that's meant to bring people closer to God is being excluded and being used to make rich people richer and poor people poorer. There was a cartel, all because of this man, Caiaphas. And people were having to spend virtually almost a month's wages just to fulfill their obligations as a Jewish person. Money they could ill afford. Money they could ill uh, afford to give. And this began to happen around about AD 30. And when did Jesus first cleanse the temple? It was around about A.D., between A.D. 30 and A.D. 34. He went into the temple. He looked at what was going on. He was angry. He overturned the tables of the money changers. He overturned the tables of the merchants. He drove the merchants out of the temple. And three years later, he comes back to see how they got on. And the night he comes into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey... 
the first thing he does is go to the temple and he looks around and he sees to his dismay and anger that the stalls are still there. Nothing has changed in the three years. The people are still being exploited. The light is still being darkened. The gospel message has gone from good news to bad news and he is angry. And so the following day, he goes to a fig tree like the temple. When the fig tree displays it has life, but no fruit, it's cursed. And when he comes to the Jerusalem temple, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, this glorious manifestation of wonder and delight, of architectural beauty, he is angry and he casts out the temple, um, the, the people who are in, in, in the courts. He drives them out. And he's angry for several reasons. He's angry because of the exploitation of the people. And he's angry because they were excluding the people that were meant to be in the temple. You see, where they were at this time was the court of Gentiles. And the, court, the temple court had four areas to it. The very first court that came into it was the court of Gentiles. The second court was the court, the third court was, uh, second court was the court of the women. The third court was the court of the men. And the last court was the court of the priests. And within the court of the priests, there was the holies of holies. And this court of Gentiles was the only area which people who were not Jews could worship God in. It was the only area. But they couldn't come into this place because it was no longer a place for Gentiles. It was a place turned into a market. And God's house was meant to be a house of prayer. But how can you pray in the middle of a market with the baying of the, 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 the donkeys and the noise of the sheep? And the, and the birds and the shouting of the merchants. And the smell of animal excrement all around the place. It was no longer a place of prayer. It was a place of commerce. They kept, kept, kept out the Gentiles because the Gentiles weren't important to them. Non-Jewish people were not important. It was a place of exclusion. And Jesus is very angry. And the place that should be a place of prayer, no one could pray in. We're told in verse 15 and 16, Jesus began driving out those who were buying and selling. He overturned the tables and money changers on the benches and those selling doves. And would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. Verse 17, he said, is it not written? Is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of robbers. Jesus has just come up from, Jeru from Jericho to Jerusalem. That road, the road to Jericho, was a place famous for robbery, famous for banditry. That's this place you hear about the Good Samaritan, isn't it? Going on that road, famous. And Jesus was saying, you know, I've just come up through the, the bandit territory of Jer Jer Jericho to Jerusalem, and I didn't find robbers there. I found robbers in the house of God. I found robbers on God's holy hill. I found robbers in the temple itself. There's a wonderful promise in Isaiah. God says, there I will bring my holy mountain and give them the joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifice will be accepted on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And that's what the modern church is meant to be. A house of prayer for all nations. There's no exclusion in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're there for all nations. Every person, no matter what class, whatever color they are, they are welcome to worship God because we're all the same. We come to worship him in the house of prayer. They turned it into a place of robbers. And that's why the chief priests, we're told in verse 18, begin to look for a way to kill him. Because he basically called them out and showed them for who they really were. This passage is so powerful. It shows the heart of the gospel. Jesus comes to bring good news to people. He comes in peace. But he also comes on an inspection. But what we need to remember when we read about the, 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 the um, Palm Sunday is this. Is that Jesus is coming again. And we must never read this in isolation and think it as a purely historical text, talking about an historical event, because it is actually also a prophetic event. 
It looks forward to the time that Jesus will return. And this is really important because this is at the heart of what's happening in Palm Sunday. Jesus is coming as king. And he comes in peace and says, I come to you. I come to you to be your king. How do you receive me? Do you receive me like the other pilgrims and tear down branches and say, Hosanna, Lord, save me? Or do you react with anger and fear like the Jewish leaders and begin to plot how you're going to silence Jesus Christ? How are you going to kill him? In what way can you silence him? There's this wonderful prophecy in Revelation chapter 19. It's a long passage, but I need to read it to you now. Here John says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven are following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury, the wrath of God Almighty. On his, robe are the, on, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who is that? Who is that? Tell me. It's Jesus. He has the name, the word of God. Who else has on his fire, King of kings and Lord of lords? It is Jesus. And Jesus, when he returns, does not return on a comical animal like a donkey. He comes on a white horse. And this is Jesus telling everyone, listen, I come in peace now. Call out to me now, Hosanna. Lord, save me. Because when I come back, it is too late. That door has closed. That opportunity has been missed. And when I return, I return on the white horse. You know, this is both wonderful and terrifying. It's wonderful. I mean, we've been watching, I don't know if you watched that documentary on, on the BBC um, called National Treasures, National Disgrace. Did you watch that? About people involved, you know, um, national treasures like Rolf Harris um, and uh, Jimmy Savile. Um, you know, about the fact that they, in public sight, were abusing people, abusing women and abusing children. And, um, and, 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 well, it was a culture within the BBC that covered it up. And when you come to Jimmy Savile, Jimmy Savile was the first one to, to be noted with the Savile um, uh, Committee, the Savile Investigation. But he died. And he was honoured. It was like a royal, we- uh, royal, royal death when he died. And there was mass crowds coming out, hysteria. He had a military bearer party to bring him into the church in, in which he was, his funeral was held. He was being honoured. And only months afterwards, it came out that that man was a monster. And people say, oh, it's terrible. He never saw justice. Oh, he will. Jimmy Savile will see justice. And will every person... For the, for the way they've lived their lives because Jesus is coming again. And when he comes, he comes on a white horse. He comes to conquer. And those who don't follow him have already laid down their arms and say, Lord, save me. He will conquer. That's what we're told. Not because he's horrible, but because he's given people every opportunity to respond to him. Every opportunity to cry out, Lord, save me me the message in this passage is that when he comes to that fruit tree that fig tree expecting to find fruit if he finds no fruit beware beware because he will curse the fig tree but doesn't bear fruit jesus says in luke 11 verse 23 this whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters There's only two responses to Jesus. It is, Lord, save me, or go away. There's no sitting on the fence. That doesn't happen with Jesus Christ. The people who choose to ignore Jesus, to reject him, to ignore God, have made a decision, and God gives us our decisions. 
He believes in free will. He allows us to make the decision to follow him or to reject him. Jesus said, whoever is not with me is against me. There's no two ways, either for him or against him. People, as we hear about Palm Sunday, let's tear down the branches. Let's take off our cloaks. Let's lay them before the Lord and welcome him into our church and into our lives. Let's shout out, Hosanna, Lord save us, because we need saved from ourselves and from an eternal future without him. Amen. And so we come now to communion. Um, Robin, do you want to come and give me a hand, please, getting the, uh, the table forward? The table of the Lord is spread for those who will come and see in the broken bread and poured out wine, symbols of the life of Jesus, shed for us upon the cross and raised again on the third day. The risen Christ is present among his people and it's here that we meet him. This is for those who love him a little and long to know him more. And the invitation is to all who are seeking him and all who are weary of their sin to come and share in this feast that is the Lord's Supper. The Bible is quite clear. There is none of us who are good. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus says, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Let's bow our heads. Lord, as we come to this table on this Palm Sunday, None of us here is worthy. None of us here can stand before you in our own strength, in our own goodness. None of us can say, I'm a good person. I've never done anything wrong. Father, we stand before you as sinners, as people who have fallen, who are corrupted. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. And we thank you, Lord, that you sent your forgiveness in the most precious form of your son, Jesus that he died in our place, a lamb without blemish. And that, Lord, he rose again on the third day because you approved of his sacrifice on our behalf. And his perfection, his righteousness is given to us. So we take off our dirty, stained, holy garments and we lay them at the foot of the cross. And receive a gown from him, a wonderful pure gown that makes us, gives us righteous standing before you. Lord, we thank you, but you've done it all. You have done it all, every single bit. We have no works to offer. You have done it all, and we are grateful. And Lord, as we come to this table now, may it be a time of reaffirming our faith, and growing closer in our belief. And Father, if there's people here in the church who have never given their heart to you, have never really said, Hosanna, Lord, save me, may they make that time now. May they take opportunity to say those simple words, those three words, Lord, save me, Hosanna, that they may experience the joy of welcoming you into their lives 
and receive the wonder of your forgiveness, the peace that comes with the Prince of Peace. But they too, like us, can look forward to eternity with hope and joy. Lord Jesus, make it so. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes of the communion service in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. There he says, For I have received from the Lord, while I also passed on to you. The Lord, when he had given thanks, took bread and broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As you receive the bread, um, please eat it as you receive it and pray in your hearts. Um, and then when we receive the wine, if you can hold on to the cup and we drink together as a sign of our community as one being one in the body of Jesus. Can I have the service please? Thank you.
left and two people left to serve. <laughs> Jehovah Jireh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. As they saw Jesus enter in Jerusalem, they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and to work for your praise and glory. Amen. Well, when Julie was speaking earlier on about um, the, those standing for uh, deacons, um, it's one, wonderful. We need a team of people to stand and to help us as, as leaders in the church to do all the business, all the things behind the scenes that we often take for granted. And it's really great. They've got a really good uh, bunch of people who are standing. I do encourage you to come along to the church meeting just on the Tuesday following Easter, Easter Monday, and to be part of that meeting and to vote in that meeting and to use your um, uh, uh, rights as a member of the church to take part in, in that way of calling people to serve the Lord. But there's one name on that list that may be surprised you by its absence. Kevin wasn't there. Um, and it's not because we've forgotten Kevin. It's not because he didn't want to stand as a deacon. It's because um, in the, the last few weeks, when truth over, over, over many months, there's been a recognition that what uh, Kevin offers his church is actually not just to serve as a, in a role of, of service like a deacon, but in the, people have recognized him spiritual values that mark him out to become an elder, and he's been invited to become an elder. So I can invite Kevin to come out now. He, he knows he was coming out now. I haven't asked him to say anything, so don't worry, Kevin. I'm not going to spring on you any, any, anything. But eldership is, is a role within the church whereby the church recognizes and people recognize gifts in a person that they see, sense that this person could be called to the role of elder, which is a, a role of spiritual oversight in the church and responsibility. And I'm really pleased, Kevin, that you've um, felt able to um, say yes, that you will stand uh, for, for this role in the church. It's really important that in all our roles and deacons and following um, the uh, following the church meeting um, on the 19th, we will also have a chance to, to honour those standing for deacon and we'll be praying from at the front. But when you're doing any role in the church, you don't do it in your own strength. If you do it in your own strength, you fall terribly and, and you really do have problems. You know, like the wonderful story of how we build our house. We build it in sand, you know, the foundations collapse and so does the person. We have to build it upon the rock of Jesus. We do it in his strength. And so I'm going to invite both Julia and Ray to come out and we're going to put our hands upon um, Kevin and ask God to bless him. I'd like to ask Margaret to come out as well. If you, are you okay coming out? Because you're an important part of that relationship. Really lovely to see you here, Margaret, today. Okay. So, yeah, we're going to... So we're going to put our hands upon and to pray for this family and especially for Kevin. Father God, we thank you for the gifts you've put in to Kevin. We thank you, Lord, for his rich history that has had highs and lows where you've used and trained him, when you've given him perseverance, when you've taught him perhaps through some very difficult times how to trust in you. We thank you, Father God, for the richness of his knowledge of Scripture and for his desire to see you honoured in the church and for the church to walk faithful to your word. We thank you, Father. I don't know Kevin as well as many people in this church, but you know him the best, Lord. You knew this man while he was still in his mother's womb. Your hand was upon him even then. 
And we just thank you for him, Father. And we pray as he stands in this role of becoming an elder of this church, that, Lord, you may bless him and anoint him. Give him wisdom. Give him compassion. Give him a pastoral spirit. Anointing that comes from you, that you, you may enable him to be what he needs to be to fulfill this role within this church. Lord Jesus, bless him. Bless Margaret. Grant them strength. Grant them peace. Grant them all they need to be. The grace to serve you. To your glory, Lord Jesus. To your glory. Amen. So it's one last thing to do, I think, on a Palm Sunday service. It's not quite a, a given, but it's something that most churches do, and I think we're glad to do it, and that's to sing that lovely hymn written by Graham Kendrick, Make Way, Make Way. And let's use it as a prayer this Palm Sunday to ensure that Jesus is made Lord of our lives, welcomed into our lives as Christ the King. <coughs> taken during the singing of that song. Jesus, we do fling wide the gates. We welcome you into our lives. We ask you, Lord, to change us and to make us better people. May we show and shine with your light. Lord, any areas of darkness, we ask you to chase them away. Make us new people. Make us better people. Make us people that shine with your light, Lord Jesus. That where we go, we will bring good news. Where we go, we may bring peace. Where we go, we may bring grace. But most of all, Lord Jesus, where we go, we may bring you, King Jesus, into this world, to your glory. Amen.